Lord, and minister healing unto him. We pray for Wendell Miller as well, God, undergoing treatment. We ask God that you would just touch his body, Lord, and touch, minister to him. Other needs, God, uh, each hand that was raised, God, and requests uh, represented there, we pray for each one. Looking to you, God, knowing that uh, you answer prayer, God, and we thank you so much for that. Lord, touch our service today. We pray your anointing upon each thing that's done here today, God. Let it be done for your glory and your honor, Father. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. All right, the title of our lesson today is A United Kingdom Divided. And our central truth is godly people seek the Lord rather than evil counsel. And I got to tell you, uh, as I studied this lesson and started getting my thoughts together, uh, so much of it reminded me of the situation that we face today as a, as a nation. It's really, I mean, it, I mean, just, just, just open your eyes and, as we look into this, and, and I think we can all identify with a lot of the same things that are going on, you know, in our country today. So a united kingdom divided. Our uh, introduction <clears throat> tells us that Solomon had succeeded in expanding the power of David's throne, but it came at great expense to the people. Generations before the prophet Samuel had, uh, had warned the people that a, that a mon monarchy would, would result in the oppression of the people. Solomon's reign was described as a grievous service, a heavy yoke. And with the transition of the reign, reign to Rehoboam, the people hoped for relief, but the temptation of power would prove too great for Rehoboam. He would prove to be a toxic leader, and his reign would be a disaster for the United Kingdom he inherited from his father and grandfather. And that word toxic, I may use that several times in today's lesson. So, uh, so Sol our introduction, you know, Solomon's reign, you know, it did. It started out good, uh, the building of the temple, expansion of the kingdom, and there's two things that God had warned Solomon about, two specific things of many that, that God warned Solomon about. And, and one was, uh, you know, as Solomon got involved and, and kept expanding the kingdom, his lifestyle became more and more extravagant. Uh, First Kings uh, uh, chapter 10, verses 18 through 20 tells us, the king made a great throne of ivory. And overlaid it with pure gold. The throne had six steps, and the top of the throne was round. At the back, there were armrests on either side of the place of the seat. Two lines stood beside the armrest. Twelve lines stood there, on, one on each side of the six steps. Nothing, nothing like this had been made for any other kingdom. Uh, other scriptures tells us that he made so many uh, plates of armor and so many shields out of pure gold. Um, and, and so, uh, and then verse 23 tells us, that, so King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the earth. You know, if it just said in wisdom, that would be okay, but in riches and wisdom. And as he was accumulating all of this wealth, what was happening to the, the people, the citizens of the kingdom, uh, taxation, uh, they were paying more and more. They were taking home less and less. Uh, I told you to remind you how, <laughs> how things are today. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, so again, you know, God's warning rang true uh, to the people when they wanted a king so bad. And God warned them and told them, said, it's going to come to pass that, that you're going to be in such a heavy burden with your uh, children being drafted and all the things that will be going on, the, the heavy burden that the king will cause to be placed upon you, that you're going to cry out to me. Uh, but, you know, you, you're getting what you asked for. You're getting the king. Uh, so the second thing that, that Solomon got involved in that he was warned about, we all know, uh, chapter 11, there it is, verses 1 through 3, but King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the... Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. Watch this. From the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel and warned, You shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Why? Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives, princes, 300 concubines. His wife turned away his heart. 
If only the Oak Ridge boys had been around. They, they've been around a long time, right? But I don't think they were around in Solomon's time. They could have sung them the song, you know, trying to love two women is like a ball and chain. Sometimes the pleasure ain't worth the pain. It's a long old, old grind, and it tires your mind. That's with two. What about a, a thousand, right? So Solomon, his old age, turned away from God. Not only did he sin, you know, you know we talked about this before, the, the Bible's so honest, you know, that you, you look at David and different ones that sinned, but still their heart was turned toward God, and they sought uh, for forgiveness. But, but Solomon, in, in this state here, in this period of time in his life, uh, with the foreign gods that all of, all of his wives had, the wisest of men, the wisest of men, all this wisdom, what happened? He allowed these temptations to enter into his life, and even the wisest of men didn't have the will to resist. Uh, you know, we mentioned this last week. It's so important for you and I to remove any temptation that we encounter. Uh, you know, our mindset will tell us, well, I can handle that. I can handle that, but before you know it, it's going to handle you. I mean, that, you know. And, and here's a good example of that, uh, uh, to, to, to remove any temptation, get it away from you, you know, push it away. So, so here's the formula that we're looking at today uh, with the nation of Israel, a nation that is overburdened <clears throat> and a nation that has uh, uh, ungodly or toxic leadership. Let's go ahead and get into our lesson. Chapter 12, we're going to look at, there's a whole lot of verses that they listed here, I'm trying to not add so many here, but, but you know, at least get the ones that, that, that we need to look at. Verses 3 through 5, that they sent and called him. Then Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now therefore lighten the burdensome service of your father and his heavy yoke, which he put on us, and we will serve you. So he said to them, Depart for three days, then come back to me. And the people departed. So, so remember, God had promised David, your, your son will build a temple. He will reign over Israel. Your house will uh, forever uh, reside upon the throne of Israel. And, of course, Solomon did sin and turned his heart from God. God is disappointed. God is angry. But because of his promise to David, Solomon remains in power, it remains as king until his death. And now his son Rehoboam is chosen to take, to take his place, and they go to Shechem for this coronation. And the people come before him with a petition, a request. They said, uh, this, this taxation has put such a heavy burden on us, we, we need some relief, uh, some sign that, that you will acknowledge, you know, how great this burden is and, 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 and you know, and ease up on us a little bit. And Rehoboam's answer was, give me three days. Give me three days, I'll, I'll give you an answer. And, um, and so Rehoboam goes to the elderly advisors, probably maybe some of his father's advisors, I guess, uh, and, uh, and, and ask them, what, you know, what should I do? The people have come to me with this, uh, with this petition, and their answer was, uh, if you'll be a servant to these people today and serve them and answer them and speak good words to them, they will be your servants forever. But that's not what Rehoboam wanted to hear because he, re you know, he rejected that advice. Sometimes people may come to you for your advice or your opinion, but don't take it personally if they don't receive it because a lot of times they've already decided what they want to hear. And Rehoboam's done decided here what, what he wants to hear, isn't he? So he goes to uh, some of his uh, uh, contemporaries and, uh, and goes to them and asks them, you know, what advice are you going to give me? How should we answer the people that, that say the light and the yoke? Then the young men who had grown up with him spake to him, saying, uh, you speak to this people who have spoken to you, saying, your father made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter on us. Thus you shall say to them, my little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. In other words, uh, you've got to show the people right away that you are in charge. 
and you have to uh, show them by your actions, by what you're going to do here, um, increase their burden. Um, stop here just for a minute, and I can look back on my life, especially, you know, as a young person, as a young convert, and I can tell you that I've made some decisions that I look back now on, and I think, what in the world was I thinking? And experience is a great teacher, isn't it? Uh, when we learn how to use the experience that we have. And, and this is a good example of that uh, where uh, these more experienced advisors gave Rehoboam some good advice and he, and he turns it down. Any comments here before we go on? Alrighty. So, uh, next part of our lesson, the king answered the people roughly, rejected the advice which the elders had given him, and he spake to them according to the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, I'll chastise you with scourges. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. Now it came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam had come back, they sent for him and called him to the congregation and made him king over all of Israel. There was none who followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. So after three days, they return. Um, they have Jeroboam here as their spokesman, Jeroboam, I think from the house of Joseph. But uh, just a little history here on Jeroboam, Solomon had seen uh, the talent and the leadership that Jeroboam had, his qualities, and he had placed him in charge of different building projects. One day the prophet uh, Ahijah approaches Jeroboam. He has a new garment on. He takes it off. He tears it into 12 pieces. He hands 10 of those pieces to Jeroboam and, and declares uh, Solomon's kingdom is going to be rent or torn and uh, these ten pieces represent ten tribes that you uh, are going to reign over. Uh, and the reason being that this is happening, of course, is because of idol worship. And then in, and in the prophet went on, went on and told Jeroboam, if you will walk in the ways of Jehovah and do what is right, keep his commandments, keep his statutes as David did, I will be with you. I'll build an enduring house for you as I've done David. And that was Jeroboam's promise uh, from this prophet. Um, and, of course, word gets out that Jeroboam, you know, has this, uh, has this prophesied over him, and Solomon sets out to try to kill him, and he has to flee the country. And that sounds a lot like David, doesn't it, because the same thing happened to him uh, when Saul heard that he was anointed king. So now Jeroboam's return, and he speaks for the people, and Rehoboam's answer is not, not what, uh, what the experienced advisors wanted. It wasn't what the people wanted to hear either, uh, because when he declares to them the heaviness of the burden is going to be increased, here the nation, here's the division. You know, it splits. The ten tribes, the ten which we call the northern kingdom, uh, separates from, from the southern kingdom of Judah, Benjamin, and the Levitical priests stayed with Judah because Jerusalem was located there where the temple was. And so uh, they separate, they, they split here uh, into, into two separate nations. And, you know, it all goes back, you know, a lot of this roots goes back to Solomon, you know, and, and how he how he did, and, and now, you know, it just continues on through his son Rehoboam, he discounts this good advice, uh, uh, the king's duty, the leader's duty, to shepherd the people, be responsible, that's what a good leader is supposed to do, and it's what we should expect out of a good leader, right? Be responsible. Instead, these leaders were motivated more by power. They were motivated more by wealth. Uh, 
They had little regard for the people that they were supposed to serve. I told you this lesson would remind you a lot of what's going on today. <laughs> uh, so this, this toxic leadership, as we know, continues. Um, so remember, um, you know, even for the, for the northern kingdom as well, it leads to their destruction. So yeah, we need to be concerned about our leaders today, don't we? We need to be concerned about who leads us. Uh, the toxicity in our nation's capital, it's very toxic, isn't it? You don't, you don't have to be there to see that. Uh, very uncertain times that, that we're living in. So, so Jeroboam, again, you know, the northern kingdom separates. They go their own way. But remember what, what the prophet had promised what did the prophet promise Jeroboam? If you will, uh, through God, God spoke through this prophet and said, if you will you know, walk in my way, if you will keep my statutes, keep my commandments, I will honor that and bless your house, and your house will, be, will, have a, you know, will endure over, over this northern kingdom, and they, and they would have been blessed if, if that would have happened. So what, what happened? What did Jeroboam do? We know what he did. Uh, the first thing he did, he goes and he builds two golden calves and sets them up for for the northern tribes to worship uh, so they wouldn't have to go back to Jerusalem to the temple and, 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 and worship. So, so here you see, you know, the leader of Judah, Rehoboam, a very toxic leader, and you see the same thing for the northern kingdom as well uh, as he uh, is motivated not by what is best for the people because God had already declared that to him what it would be, but he's motivated again by what's, what's in it for me. You know, what, what, what am I going to get out of this? Uh, he was afraid that he would lose uh, his people if they had to return back to Jerusalem to worship. So, so this is the, the splitting of the nation of Israel, the, the separation. Any comments here on these verses? Well, come on now. Don't go to sleep on me. Well, the more I study this lesson, the more it reminded me of what's going on today, especially in this in this time period here, of course, where there was actually a division. Um, but it all goes back to the character of whether it's a priest or whether it's a prophet, whether it's a, a president, whether it's a governor, the character of that person what, and what motivates that person, right? You know, we want good leaders. We want people that, you know, again, the king's responsibility in that day was to be a shepherd for the people, do serve the people. Serve the people. And it's hard to find that today. It's hard to find that, that, that characteristic in, uh, in leaders, political leaders. Um, and, it's in, and that's what, you know, that's what caused, uh, that was the downfall of, of Israel. I mean, you know, as we get into it a little more, we're going to find out. You know, it, it all goes back to the leaders that, that led the people uh, which also made the choice to do the same thing, to worship idols, uh, to, to turn from Jehovah, to turn from God. And, and that was her downfall. And I'm afraid it may be our downfall as well. But we, we, if, we, if we're going to be a, you know, in our nation today, even if we have to be a remnant, we need to stay true we need to stand for the for 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 what god has spoken to us through his word no matter what leader is in charge and and that'll that will bring you to victory no matter what happens around you any other comments Okay, let's go on to uh, um, the next part of our lesson. 
and we're, we're, so we're looking at, uh, at the two kingdoms now, Judah, the southern kingdom. Uh, they had, uh, over a span of 344 years, they had 19 kings. The northern kingdom, Israel, over a span of 209 years, also had 19 kings. All 19 kings of the northern kingdom, uh, the Bible tells us they, they were evil. So they had, you know, toxic leadership. Uh, the southern kingdom, a little bit different, and we're going to look at, at two of the kings of Judah. And we're going to look at first the worst. Well, that's a good, it's a good title, isn't it? Manasseh, the worst king of Judah. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hephzibah, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah his father destroyed. He raised up altars for Baal and made a wooden image as Ahab king of Israel had done. He worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. And when he's talking about hosts of heaven here, what he means is the sun, the moon, the stars. He's not talking about, about God. So Manasseh, the worse, uh, uh, the son of Hezekiah, who was a, you know, was a godly king, uh, a king who ruled in faithfulness. Uh, and Manasseh is the complete opposite. His reign begins at the age of 12. He reigns for 55 years. He's got a long, a long tenure. Uh, Hezekiah's father had torn down a lot of altars and, and groves that uh, idol worship was conducted in, and, uh, and now Manasseh rebuilds those. He, he leads Judah in committing idol worship, committing sin, the same horrible sins that were practiced by the nations that God drove out of this, out of this country, out of this land, and he drove them out of that land for that reason, for, for their worship of idols, and here Manasseh is leading Judah back into that same that same thing again. So, uh, so if the people would uh, choose to live like the Canaanites, then God's going to treat them like that. You know, that's pretty much uh, what we find out here. Uh, what all did did Manasseh do? Verses six and seven says he made his son pass through the fire. That means he sacrificed his son in fire. He practiced soothsaying. Uh, witchcraft, consulted spiritless and mediums. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. He even set a carved image of Asherah that he, had, he had made in the house of which the Lord had said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever in the temple. So, so yeah, he, he, he sacrificed his son in fire. He practiced witchcraft, sorcery, divination, all these things. Uh, and again, went so far as to erect altars and images of false gods in the temple. A temple that had been dedicated to God, to Jehovah. So now what we refer to as the Holy Land is defiled. Jerusalem was now the great harlot under the leadership of Manasseh. Uh, it was also a very violent reign, and of course violence, you know, goes along with that, doesn't it? Uh, uh, verse uh, 16, chapter 21, Moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another besides his sins by which he made Judah sin in doing evil in the sight of the Lord. Uh, he would kill his political rivals. He would, he would kill for the pleasure of it. Evil. Uh, he had an assassination squad that would go out and just and kill people. Uh, so tradition also tells us that uh, Manasseh, Manasseh ordered the execution of Isaiah the prophet, had him sawed in half evil um, and the sins of the king became the sins of the people so there's your leadership right verse 9 uh, the people paid no attention Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel so now 
look at the situation. The children of Israel are, are, do, are practicing more evil than the Canaanites and all the ites that were driven out of that land. So they've, they've gone even further into sin. And, and, and again, the people were seduced, but they made that choice. You know, you can say they were seduced. They are, I mean, you know, and that's what temptation will do uh, for us as well. You know, that's what temptation does. It will seduce us to make the wrong choice. And that's what happened uh, for them. And in verses 14 and 15, so I will forsake the remnant of my inheritance and deliver them to the hand of their enemies. They shall become victims of plunder to all their enemies because they have done evil in my sight, provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came out of Egypt, even to this day. So here's God's judgment. Judgment declared on Judah, the southern kingdom, uh, captivity. We know that's what's going to happen. Uh, so, you know, what's the message? God is, you know, God's merciful. We know that. God is forgiving. We know that. But sin has consequences. That's what we've been talking about for the last two or three lessons, you know, from, you know, generation, generation down. Sometimes, you know, the sin that one generation commits there's going to be some consequences, and sometimes those consequences fall on the next generation. So that's why it's so important for us uh, to guard ourselves spiritually. Paul, writing to the church at Thessalonica, gives us this warning. Abstain from every form of evil. Get it away from you, the temptations, you know, that, uh, that try to seduce you, the things that will pull you away from God or separate you from your relationship with God. Abstain from them. Get rid of them. Get rid of them. Because here we see a whole nation being affected by, uh, by, the, by their leader. Any comments here? Okay, that was the worst king. Now let's look at one of the best, Josiah. Chapter 22, verses 1 and 2. Josiah was eight years old when he became king. He reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidah. I know I'm really hitting those words real good. The daughter of Adai of Bozkath, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. So Manasseh dies. His son Ammon is king, reigns for two years. He's, uh, he's assassinated. Uh, uh, and, and, and now Josiah is made king at the age of eight years old. And, and what happens? Well, you look, we'll see what happens. Second Chronicles now, 34 and 3, talking about Josiah. For in the eighth year of his reign, so he started at, year, at eight years old, so he was 16 years old here, while he was still young. Look at what he does. He began to seek the God of his father, David, and in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the wooden images, the carved images, the molded, molded images. So Josiah begins to seek God and, and, and it has an effect on him as it will you and I if when we truly with all of our hearts seek God it's going to have a good effect on you and so, so what happens he starts cleaning up the land the land is, uh, the land is filthy it's filthy with sin um, all the, all the idols, all the groves, all the things, you know, that were pulling people away from God. You know, worship this, worship that. And, and Josiah decides, well, let's, you know, we begin to clean this up. That's what we need to do. And then they start uh, working on the temple. Well, this temple that had been neglected uh, for so many years uh, under the reign of Manasseh, 
So now, uh, under the direction of Josiah, they begin to clean this temple up. Then Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, uh, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. A book? What is that book? And Shaphan <laughs> read it before the king. Now it happened when Josiah heard the words of the book of the law that he tore his clothes. Fifty-five years of evil reign, God's word is lost. It's lost. They can't, they, nobody knows where it's at. A uh, copy of the law in those days was precious, maybe the only copy in existence. I don't know. Uh, but, but, you know, and, and cleaning up the temple and cleaning out all those altars and things that they had that they'd put in there and, and trash whatever was in there they find this book and they begin to read it and Josiah recognizes it for what it is it is the book of the law uh, and now he orders them to read it and as they hear the words as they hear God's word God's word begins to identify things that they are not doing that they need to be doing and it also identifies things that they're doing that they don't need to be doing and as we study God's word as we let it work in our life and in our heart it will also show us things that we're not doing that we need to be doing and maybe things that we're doing that we don't need to be doing so so here it is, it's uh, the, word of the, God, the word of God and the effect it has. Uh, they go to the prophetess uh, Huldah and she kind of, you know, clarifies some of the, some of the writings, what, you know, what it means and actually tells them, you know, according to, according to this book of the law, judgment is fall, you know, has already been declared upon Judah, you know, it's, you know, it's already been declared because of all the idol worship that is that has previously taken place but Josiah determines he has a choice for himself even under the hand of judgment he has a choice what what can I do do I continue and let and allow the people to to worship idols and to forsake the word of God or do I lead the people back to the word of God Back to true worship, and that's what Josiah does. He, he returns the people to God. He hears the word. He, he has it read in the ears of, of others. As the word is being declared, they, they are obedient to it. And, and, and all of a sudden, you've got revival, even under you know, the hand of judgment that is to come. And, and as we look at Josiah's reign, uh, chapter 23, 3 says, Then the king stood by pillar and he made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart with all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book and because the leader did that all the people take a stand for the covenant so how important how important is a godly leader? Uh, Josiah covenanted with God. So what happened? Well, verse 25 kind of sums up Josiah's reign. Now before him, there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor after him, did any rise like him? He was truly devoted to God, unlike, as we go back to Solomon, who had the wisdom, but what we say? He lacked the will. He allowed those temptations to stay so close to him that finally he fell to him. Josiah's devotion to God drove him to be faithful. To be faithful and 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 that was a testimony of his reign uh, 25 years or so after his reign ended Judah goes into captivity but 
that's, that shows us the importance of leadership and, and, and the character of, of a leader and what a true leader should be. A shepherd of the people. A servant of the people. Not motivated by power, not motivated by, you know, wealth or whatever. Any comments here? Last part of our lesson. We're going back to the nation. Let's remind you just for a minute here. Back in Deuteronomy eleven twenty six through 28, God declares to Israel uh, as they are... Uh, taking the promised land under, uh, under Joshua. Before, before, behold, bleh, behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way which I command you today to go after other gods which you have not known. So very plainly God declares to the people, when they enter the promised land. A blessing if you serve me, a curse if you don't. Very simple, very plain. Uh, and, and so we, and again, we know, we know what happened. Uh, the northern kingdom, the ten tribes uh, under Jeroboam and, and, and the kings that followed him uh, continued in idol worship so that judgment was declared upon them. It says the king of Assyria uh, uncovered a conspiracy by Hoshea, who was king at this time, for he had sent messengers to Saul to the king of Egypt. He was going to make a pact with him to, uh, to revolt against Assyria because he had to pay tribute to them. It didn't work. He found, the king found out about it, uh, come in, uh, captured uh, he, the king, bound him in prison, went throughout the land, uh, besieged it for three years, uh, uh, utterly, you know, that, that kingdom was utterly, you know, destroyed uh, and, 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 and just wiped out. We know that. Um, so, uh, and the reason why, the reason why God declares again, for so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord, who had brought them up, uh, and had walked in the statutes of the nations whom the Lord had cast out. Remember the Canaanites, you know, they had been cast out because of their idol worship, and here the Israelites have fallen into that same pattern. So, yeah, God's going to, you know, God's no respecter of person, even though, you know, you are part of, you know, Israel, God's chosen people. You know, if you don't serve God, if you don't walk in his statutes, you're not going to, uh, you're not going to receive the blessings of God. You're going to receive the judgment of God. And we have also that same warning, if you will, from Hebrews chapter 10. For if we sin willfully, and what that, that doesn't mean, you know, you know, we're all subject to commit a sin. God is merciful. You, you seek repentance for that, God will forgive you. For if we sin willfully, if we continue in that pattern of sin, if we continue that lifestyle of sin, after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment. You, you, it makes sense, you know. Judgment's going to come if you live in sin. Fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. And l listen to this. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, discounted or counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sacrificed, a common thing? Just, just live any old way, you know. Uh, insulted the Spirit of grace, uh, the Holy Spirit that convicts, don't pay any attention to it. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. So again, God is full of mercy, he's full of grace. There's coming a day of judgment. And it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Look at what happened to the northern kingdom of Israel. 
uh, and even you know God's chosen people, even the southern kingdom is 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 going to be placed in captivity to try to teach them, uh, you know, how to live and how to conduct themselves. Um, so the time's about gone. So what we'll we'll just sum it up, I guess, here, you know, by just reminding us, reminding you and I, you know, we have to look to God's word. We have to be obedient to his word. We have to live a holy life. Uh, that's, that's what God's people are called to do. And whether our leadership leads us in that direction or not, we have a, we have a leader that is higher than our mayor, our governor, even our president. And that's who we're to look to. We're to look to Christ, the author and the finisher, the beginning and the end of your faith. And that's what counts, and that's what counts for us, how we should live. We appreciate your attention and comments this morning. Hey, want to welcome everybody this morning. Got a good, good crowd this morning, and it seemed like just every Sunday, just get a few more and a few more, and and that's the way we love it. We love to see everybody come out, and and uh, we want everybody protected, but uh, we love to do do love seeing church. And got a lot of visitors this morning. Want to welcome all of our visitors. Yeah, glad to have y'all with us. Glad you chose Bonnard this morning. We'll try to treat you as good as we can and just keep coming every chance you get. We do. We just appreciate every, each one. Uh, just had to finish revival this week and uh, had a wonderful revival with Sister Betty. And uh, I don't know if you was here, you enjoyed it. She done an ext- outstanding job uh, preaching every night. And the uh, Lord was here and blessed. And, uh, and if you wasn't here, you missed it. She did. She she preached her heart out and just... Uh, 
hope everybody still just keep that revival spirit going, and we'll just have, we're, Lord, he just blesses each and every day, and just, I think it's just an opportunity just to, just to be here this morning. I've uh, got a card here, read to the church. says, with special thanks, this extra special thank you note sent to you today holds more appreciation than any words can say. And for your, you're among the nicest people I have ever known, and you'll never be forgotten for the thoughtfulness you've shown. It says, thanks for everything. This card says just how I feel. It's from Sister Joy Sweet and the family, and they just wanted to thank the church for all they've done during the during the loss of Brother Adrian, and we're going to miss him, but uh, he's where he's in a lot better place this morning. Than we are, isn't it? He's he's made his he's made his last journey, and uh, that's where we're going. And just if, uh, if you're saved, that's where we're going, and it's in a special place. That's all what we're all striving for. Okay, we're going to turn it over to Pastor. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we rejoice in you today. <clears throat> we are thankful that we could come together. Lord, we rejoice in the invitation to come to your house. Call upon the name of the Lord to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, our response is that we were glad when they said unto us, let us go to the house of the Lord. Now, Lord, we're ready to worship you. We're ready to lift up your name and magnify your name. We're ready, Lord, for what you have in mind and what you have in store. Holy Ghost, you lead this service. You be the preacher. You be the guide. And Lord, we pray for deliverance. We pray for the power of the Holy Ghost to be manifested, the gifts of the Spirit to operate. And Lord, that souls will be saved and set free and delivered, healed and blessed. And Lord, that we will all accept the invitation, Jesus, of your half-brother who said, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to us. We accept that invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. How many are ready to worship the Lord in this house today? Amen. Let's stand. Come right on, Brother Jeff. Let's sing, lift up our voice to Jesus today. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's good to see you here this morning. Help us sing the Glory Land Way. <clears throat> Listen to the call, the gospel call today. Get in the Glory Land Way. Wonders come home, oh, hasten to obey and get in. The glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus saves today. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. Onward I go, rejoicing in his love. I'm in the glory land way. Soon I shall see him in that home above. Oh, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is near and the way groweth clear. For I'm in the glory land Onward I go, rejoicing in His love. I'm in the glory land way. Soon I shall see Him in that home above. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is near and I'm in the glory land way. Praise the Lord. Let's help us sing, Love Lifted Me. 
me. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. All my heart to Him I give, ever to Him I'll cling. In His blessed presence live, ever His praises sing. Love so mighty and so true. Merits my soul's best song, faithful, loving service to to Him belongs. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help love lifted me souls in danger look above Jesus completely saves he will lift you by his love out of the angry waves he's the master of the sea billows his will obey he your Savior wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me God is love isn't it yes that's where our love comes from from him I'm going to take up a prayer request this morning and do remember the Trevor Goster family, the unexpected loss, and his mother's one of Sandy's best friends growing up, and of course they're just devastated, so really hold them up in prayer this morning. Any other requests? Okay, remember, remember this. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, remember these. Okay. Yes, let's really hold her up in prayer. Yeah.
Oh, yes. Yeah, praise God. Yeah, you, you really appreciate it when you ain't got it. That's true. Brother yeah. Joe, uh, last Sunday, Allie was at the hospital, and we prayed for her, and Allie Mann is here today. Praise God. Praise God, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus, for answered prayer, and we want to continue to pray for her, that God will just strengthen her. He's a healer today. Yes. yes. How many know he's a healer? Amen. And yes. he pr answers prayer. Amen. Yeah, let's continue to remember Allie. Any others? Remember, remember Adrian, yeah. Okay, let's all stand and just take these requests and needs this morning. Lord, we come to you this morning once again, Lord. Oh, Lord, so thankful for your presence. Lord, we just feel your closeness. We feel your love this morning. Lord, we praise you. Lord, who goes that love, that feeling of love comes from nowhere else but from you, because you are a God of love. We thank you for it. Lord, we thank you for the praise report that been given in this morning. We pray for each one. Lord, continue to pray for Allie. Lord, and we pray for the Lord that Trevor Gosser found. Lord, we pray that you just be with them and comfort them. Lord, just hold them close, we pray. Lord, we pray for these unspoken requests that are given in. Lord, you know what they are. You know the needs this morning. Lord, we do. We pray for mercy, Lord, each request. Lord, we pray for those that are sick. But most of all, we pray for souls. Lord, the souls are the most important thing in this whole world. And Lord, to be lost is such a dreadful, awful thing. Lord, we pray for each one. They are pray for our loved ones. Lord, they will come in and give their lives to you and be saved. We're just trusting in you. Lord, we pray for each one that is here. Lord, if there's any here not saved, we pray that they'll give their lives to you this morning. Just bless each one. Bless each the singer, speakers. Lord, anyone of the needs, we pray that they would need to be met this morning. Lord, we just thank you in Jesus' holy name. Thank you, Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord and Savior. Glory to the Lamb of God. Praise God. Praise God. Glory to Take up tithes and offerings this morning. I want to ask Brother Roger to pray the blessing over the offering this morning. Praise God. Amen. I want to ask you just bring your offering up and put them in these buckets.
guys can stand if you'd like. another praise. Hallelujah. My, my, my. You know, the children of Israel were down there with Aaron worshiping an idol calf and God said, Moses, they're misbehaving. I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to, I'm going to get rid of them and make a nation of you. And Moses wouldn't, Moses was a type of Christ. He stood in the way, said, no, God, don't, don't destroy them. But when he came back up after he 
destroyed the idol and ground it up to powder and made them uh, drink the water of it, that bitter water, went back up to the mountain and he said, Lord, show me your glory. Show me your glory. You know, we have a choice of following the idols of this world or following Jesus. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. As for me and Bernard Ridge Church of God, we're going to follow Jesus. We're going to get rid of those idols and we're going to serve the Lord, serve Him with gladness. Open up our eyes. We want to see you. My message today is about the shield of faith and taking up the shield of faith. My friend, brothers and sisters, family of God, if there's ever a time that we need to take up the shield of faith, it is today. So good to see you, every one of you. Welcome, welcome back. Those that are visiting, don't be a visitor, be a home person. If you don't have a home church, this is the great church to become part of. We're so glad you're here. Are you registered to vote? Time is running out, isn't it, Ruth? And so uh, be sure, if you're not registered to vote, their registration cards are at the uh, Welcome Center out in front. How many tuned in this weekend to two separate events that were going on simultaneously in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C.? The return and also the 2020 uh, Washington, D.C. prayer walk. Anybody watch that? There's, oh my, yes, yes. That was a powerful, powerful uh, time. And I, I wept, darling, I wept and cried and prayed and repented, uh, especially yesterday as uh, in the, the uh, service called The Return, leading uh, in prayers of repentance for the church, for Christians, for ministers, for the body of Christ and for our nation. And uh, that's what it's going to take to bring revival, to repent, to lay aside every weight and every sin that does so easily beset us. What is plaguing the church today is spiritual idols. And it's not the kind that you see a statue, but it's the idols of recreation, the idols of sports, the idols of, uh, of uh, uh, getting out into the world and, and putting that first before we put God first. You know, Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Then all of these other things will be added unto you. If we put God first, then everything else will be blessed and God will take care of all the other things. And so it's a spiritual warfare that we're in and we cannot fight this warfare without spiritual weapons. And we're going to look at that in just a moment. If you have your Bibles and turn, you'll want to turn to Ephesians chapter 6 in just a moment. And uh, I'll be reading from that chapter. And those of you watching by live stream, Ephesians chapter 6. Get your Bibles, follow along with me. But I want to say to you, thank you for supporting the revival this past week with Sister Betty Shaver. How many were blessed and drew nearer God this week? I was. I was blessed. To God be the glory. Powerful altar services as God used uh, Sister Betty as a vessel and spoke through her to your needs, many of you. And some of them I, didn't, I wasn't even aware of till later and revealed to me that you had issues or needs or things in your life that God spoke through her. And I, that's what we need. We need that. Because God knows all about us anyway, doesn't He? There's nothing hid from Him. And so important that we all accept the invitation of Jesus' half-brother, James, who said, draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. So we're going to do that today. Now we have those who are prepared for uh, children's church and kinder church, toddler's church. So we want to dismiss our young people. God bless you as you go today in the name of the Lord. I do have a special announcement for all of our men. It's time for us to get back having our men's breakfasts. 
I thought I'd hear a cheer or something. Lord have mercy. Was that just the ladies clapping? Let here, back up, rewind, play. It's time for us to get back to having our men's breakfast. <laughs> That's a little bit better. There's nothing more important than the body of Christ fellowshipping together. So, this coming Saturday, this coming Saturday, October 3rd, 7 o'clock, come bring your appetite. Is that a problem for you guys? No, no. And uh, so, see Brother Howard, he's not here today, I don't think, but uh, get in touch with him or Brother Paul about what can be brought, but it's time for us to get together as men. God called men to be leaders, spiritual leaders, not only in the home, but also in the church. And I think we have a great men's group. I really, really do, and I'm grateful. There probably are still CDs that may not have been picked up from the revival. See Brother Danny or Leah, and they'll get those to you. Or... If you wanted copies, you can let them know, and they'll be more than glad. How many know that tonight is youth night? How about the rest of you? How many are going to come and let's support our young people tonight? I'm looking at your hands. I'm looking at your hands. Okay, the rest of you, whatever you had planned, cancel it in the name of Jesus. I'm calling Jesus as a witness. Lord, you are the witness. I'm asking you to cancel and be here tonight and let's support our young people. No pressure, no pressure, no pressure at all. <laughs> amen. Can you say amen? amen? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 10. The Apostle Paul says to us, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. How many know that Jesus is mighty and powerful? How many? Can you raise your hand today? Amen. He is mighty and powerful. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. Very important. We're in a spiritual war. We make sure that we don't step out into that battle unless we are covered. And God has provided that armor for us, but it's up to us to put it on. Why should we put it on? That we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Paul says this, this is true. Families, moms, dads, sons, daughters, families, Maybe some of you are under attack. Some of you I'm aware of. You've been attacked by the enemy. Your loved ones, your children are under spiritual attack. And Paul reveals to us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And that's a serious thing. You can't use man's weaponry, we can't use our fist, we can't use our hands, we can't kickbox our way out of it. We've got to use the powerful weapons that God has provided, spiritual weapon. Paul goes a little deeper in verse 13 and says, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Although all of those are very important and very good. But now notice what he says next in verse 16. Above all, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith we shall be able to quench or to put out all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. How many thank God for His holy Word? It's a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our path. 
This word has power and authority. This word will deliver and set free and heal. He sent his word to heal. By his word we are saved. We're begotten by the word of God. God's word is living. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even through the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow. And God's word is the learner of the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. His word is powerful. So take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And saints of God, the Bible calls upon us to be praying people. Listen to verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. We are strongest when we're down on our knees praying and calling upon the Lord and seeking His face and having a prayer life. Amen. When the weakest Christian falls on their knees in prayer, the devil begins to fear and tremble and shake and the sweat breaks out on him. When the weakest child of God falls on their knees and connects with the mighty Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ, praying in the Holy Ghost, victory comes on the wings of prayer and praise, praying in in the Holy Ghost, praying always with all prayer and supplication. Now, Brother Danny, could you take us back to verse 16 of our text? Is my focus today. Verse 16, Paul says, above all, taking the shield of faith. Heavenly Father, I thank you today. I thank you, God, that we can report victory. Lord, that we as your children do not have to live a defeated life. Lord, the enemy has come in hard this year. Satan has buffeted. Satan has fought. Satan has withstood. Satan has done many things against the church and against the body of Christ. But Lord, you reminded the disciples and you reminded us today, Lord, that though the gates of hell may prevail, it shall not prevail against the church. For we are overcomers by your blood and the word of our testimony. And Lord, we plead the blood over every situation today. We rebuke the enemy and the devourer in the name of Jesus, who is our provider and our caretaker and our covering. We pray that the shield of faith will be mighty to save and to push back against the enemy and to walk by faith and not by sight, Lord. For our desire, Heavenly Father, is to please you and to give you glory and honor and praise that one day we will hear your gentle voice say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over me. And he enter thou into the joys of thy Lord. And we pray it in the name of the author and the finisher of our faith. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. And would I hear a shout of an amen in this house today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Give the Lord a praise. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, yes, amen, amen. You know, Charles Spurgeon said, faith like a shield covers all and is therefore important above all. Look well to your confidence in God, for if this fails, all fails. If the shield of faith, if you allow it to fail in your life, then everything fails. Jesus said in Luke 22, as the darkest hour on earth was about to take place, the hour of Jesus' passion and prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, great sweat drops of blood, and then the arrest and the false trial, the fake trial and the fake accusations and hanging on the cross between heaven and earth, bearing our sins. Jesus looked over at Simon Peter and said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Now notice what Jesus prayed in verse 32. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith, notice that, that thy faith fail not. 
And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren, that thy faith fail not. Paul said, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. If we did, it would be a lot easier battle. We could at least see and, and wrestle with and try to take down and pin down the enemy. But oh, my friend, there's a greater enemy than that. That is an unseen to the natural eye, but is just as real. And the enemy would come against us like a flood. He would try to mow us down and roll over us. But oh, thank God for the church that's alive and well. Thank God for the body of Christ. The body of Christ will never be put down for it's connected to the head and the head is Jesus. Glory to God. No weapon formed against us shall prosper, child of God. Be aware of that. Have faith and believe the word of God. Whatever you're facing. There's families in this room right now. Maybe some that are watching over live stream right now. There are things that have come against you and trying to overwhelm you. You're trying to keep your head above water. But I want to remind you today that Jesus is the living water. He'll lift you up and give you strength to walk on top of the storms of your life and to walk to the boat. Glory to God. He'll give you victory to overcome. Thank God for the victory that we have in Jesus Christ. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now Paul used the metaphor of the Roman shield. He used that as an example. Not only for his people, but for us to study out and to understand. The word shield that Paul used in the Greek means a door-shaped shield. We're not talking about Captain America's little tiny thing, little round thing that has stars on it. We're not talking about that, but we're talking about a shield that the Roman soldier used was in the shape of a door. I want to remind us today that we have a door, and His name is Jesus. He said, I am the door. I am the door. When you take up the shield of faith, you're carrying the door with you. When the enemy comes against you, come on church, I'm preaching about Jesus today. When the enemy comes against you or your family, you just take up the door, the door of Jesus Christ. Praise God. Give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. 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 Albert Barnes talks about the shield of faith. In his commentary, he said the shield was usually made of light wood or a rim of brass, was covered with several folds of thicknesses of stout hide. And listen to this. This shield, this hide, this leather was preserved by frequent anointing. You got that? We need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I need it. I need that anointing. You need that anointing. Amen. Our families need the anointing. We take this oil and we do a little dab on the forehead and that's okay. We do it by faith. But I'm talking about a soaking. I'm talking about from head to toe. In the Old Testament when they anointed Aaron, he was the oil was poured all over him from head to toe. It ran down his beard, that anointing, the anointing, and oh, hallelujah, when Christ, the anointed one, you know, Jesus Christ, Jesus means deliverer, and a Christ means the anointed one. The Roman soldiers would take those shields, and there would be frequent oil anointing it and soaking it and, and the outer surface of the shield was made more or less of a, a, a rounding of center edge and was polished smooth and anointed with oil so that when the fiery darts hit it, glory to God, when they hit it, they would glance off, they would rebound. Thank God we have the anointed door of Jesus Christ as our shield of faith to come against the enemy, not in our might and our power, but in the mighty power of Jesus Christ, our King and our Lord. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So all of us here today, we have a greater shield than the Roman shield. Second Corinthians chapter 4, listen to this. 
For our weapons, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. A further study of it, uh, the question is, what do those flaming arrows represent? What flaming arrows have hit you and your family lately? What flaming arrows have come against you lately? Sister Peggy, Peggy called me the other day about her dilemma. And we had prayer. That was a flaming arrow, Sister Peggy. It was serious. Not having water. But we went to prayer over the phone and took it to Jesus. And today she has fresh water. Flaming arrows. What flaming arrows hit you lately? What flaming arrows come against you? How about your children? Did you know that Satan is no respect to persons? He'll come after your daughter. He'll come after your son. We've had the enemy try to come in to our parsonage against our children. We've had our, the enemy to try to dare to come in in the night hours when they were asleep and walk up next to their bed and they come in to our room in our bedroom trembling and fearful. When we were evangelists, Sister Cornette and I evangelized, we were reminiscing with Sister Betty about some of our experiences. And in, in the revivals, in the night hour, we'd have the enemy come into the bedroom where we were at and try to hinder us and try to distract us. One revival we were in over in Virginia, we were asleep. We were sound asleep. And it was as if somebody had grabbed the bottom of the bed sheet and jerked it off. That was the sensation. And we both woke up at the same time feeling that and feeling the sense of the enemy trying to move in and push in. What did we do? We went to prayer. The prayer of faith. The Bible talks about that. And prayed till that went away. We've had those experiences from time to time. And I'm not here to give the devil glory, but I'm here to glorify the King of kings and Lord of lords. My champion is Jesus, and your champion is Jesus. And by his blood, glory to God, we can overcome the enemy by praying and calling on him and using the shield of faith. What flaming fiery dart has attacked you lately? I've got good news for you. God has made you a shield of faith. Above all, taking the shield of faith. We hold on to faith like a shield. We deliberately choose faith in all circumstances. Whenever you and I encounter doubts, and doubt is a fiery dart, isn't it? We choose to hold on to faith. We pray that God will arm us with with it in all circumstances, whatever you and I, I don't know, I may be preaching to someone or a family here today that's about to be hit by something. And I want you to be prepared. I want you to be ready. Or maybe you're right in the thick of things right now and it's, it's knocked you down. But you're not knocked out. Child, hear me. In, in, hear me in the name of Jesus. You're not knocked out. You can get up and pick up that shield of faith and you can be a conqueror. You can overcome. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Pray, let God arm you in all circumstances. Choose to take it up. There's some that won't take up the shield of faith. There's some that would rather entertain doubt. Even when the devil keeps firing those fiery darts of doubt and deceit, if you've got that shield of faith, it'll just glance off in the name of Jesus. Give the Lord another praise. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. I did a, a little study in crosswalk.com, a Bible search. And the question is, how is faith like a shield? The shield does, not, does a lot more than just take the blows of an arrow. Consider this. When the Romans used their shield, 
that door was also a, 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 a shield that pushed back the enemy. You ever had the devil push against you? You ever? Yeah. Yeah. He tries to push in, push you, push your children. But the Romans, they would get together. I don't know how to pronounce it. I tried to get the internet to help me pronounce it. Phalanx, P-H-A-L-A-N-X, formation. That's where all the soldiers got together with all their doors and formed. It would remind you of a big turtle shell. And then they would march into the enemy and push, 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 push. And the enemy would fall back. Thank God we have the door Jesus, anointed Christ, and we can push against the enemy. And not only that, but it was a protective barrier. Faith can not only protect us from the blows of the devil, but the shield of faith can help us push back against him. You see, Jesus was tempted just like you and I are. How many know that? How many know Jesus went through? He went through every temptation. You and I have only gone through a limited, and I'm glad of that. I don't want to face it all. God will not allow you and I to be tempted above that we're able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape, that way is Jesus, that we might be able to bear it. Give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So what did Jesus do? He used the scripture as an act of faith to push back the devil. You mean Jesus used faith? Absolutely. Absolutely. He lived and walked in faith and in the power of the Holy Ghost. He was our example. And he pushed back with Scripture as an act of faith against the enemy and was victorious. The second thing is that when we use that shield of faith, we can extinguish the arrows. Third when we band with other Christians, this is what that word I shared with you, the phalanx formation. When the, the Roman soldiers, they came together and they banded together and formed a protective shield and shell against the enemy. When you and I get together like this and we, we fellowship together and we sing together and pray one for another and, and hear the preaching of the word and gather together and build one another's faith and testify and tell what the Lord has done and have examples that God is answering prayer. What does that do? It binds us together in the, and we take our individual shields and we put them together and make a mighty force. Glory to God. No wonder the devil doesn't want the church to get together. No wonder the devil hangs things out there to entice us to dr drift away from the family of God and the house of God. But oh, hallelujah, when two or three or more are gathered together in the name of Jesus, he's there in the midst and we fellowship one with another. We help one another with our doubts and fears. We help one another when one's down, the other will lift up. We encourage one another. We build one another up in the faith and say, brother, Brother, sister, you can make it. Let's go together. Let's fight this in the name of Jesus Christ. Give the Lord another praise. Hallelujah. 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 So let's look at what the Bible says about the believer's shield. The shield of faith. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 and 5. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world. What? Are you reading it? This is the victory that overcometh the world. What? Even our faith. Yes, you got it. Even our faith. Verse 5. Who is he that overcometh the world? 
But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. I underscored Jesus is. In my notes, I took my pen and just underlined Jesus is. Jesus is. Jesus is. Brother Jack, Jesus is. How many know Jesus? Would you holler that out real big and loud? Jesus is. Jesus is. Let's say it again. Jesus is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, you are, Lord. Yes, you are. Jesus is. Hebrews 11 and 6. Listen to this. For without faith, without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. We just said Jesus is, didn't we? And that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. What about the Old Testament saints? Job had faith. He prayed every day. He prayed for his children. Just in case when they got together and had a party and something slipped out or they did something that offended God, he offered up sacrifices on their behalf. He was a true example of what husbands and fathers should be, the high priest of his home, and he prayed for them every day. And Job had faith, and there was a hedge built around about him, a shield. Job 1 and 10, Satan admitted it. He confessed to God, Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house, and all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. That word hedge there means a protection. It means a restraint. It means a fence. A fence. There's an invisible fence around us today. There's a hedge of protection around us. I want you to understand that when the enemy tries to booger Joe you and hoodoo you and try to intimidate you, you say, Satan, you're on God's property. You're trespassing right now. There's a hedge of protection around about me. Jesus Christ is my shield. Get behind me, Satan, in the name of Jesus who is. Amen. Amen. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Yes, yes. What about Elisha? The prophet Elisha, was when he was surrounded by the Syrian army, a whole army. Has any of us been uh, surrounded by an army lately? What if you go home and, and, and go to bed tonight and walk up and wake up in the morning and an a, a, a army is around your house? Well, it was with Elisha. But Elisha's faith surrounded him and his servant with an angel army. Listen to this story. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15. Moms, dads, we need this for our family right now. We need this. The devil is as mad as hellfire. Hello? That's where he's going, isn't it? Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. He's mad. He's angry. He's walking about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We need this. We need this. Listen to this. Elisha, his faith protected them. <coughs> Second Corinthians chapter 6 verse 15 and when the servant of the man of God was risen early gone forth he went outside behold a host can pass the city both with chariots and horses and his servant ran into Elisha and said alas my master how shall we do what are we going to do he was wringing his hands the devil is real. His demons are real. And he was wringing his hands. And Elisha answered him, first of all, calm down. Calm down. Fear not. Fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Elisha, do you need your glasses clean? Are they smoked? Are they steamed up? Have you not seen what's out there? 
Elisha told him, son, I've got spiritual glasses I've put on this morning. I've been in prayer. And God has assured me, he, the captain of the host of the mighty army of God, is with me. And so he prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. The praise team sung about that a while ago. That phrase, it caught me while y'all was singing it. Open our eyes. We want to see you. Open our spirits. We're not talking about the natural. I read it to you a while ago. Our weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're spiritual. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. God, help us to look through the lenses of your holy word and the Holy Ghost to see the unseen. While we, uh, the, he said, open his eyes. And the young man's eyes were open. And he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. My, 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 my. Seeing the unseen. Seeing the unseen. Listen to what Paul said about it. 2 Corinthians 4, 16. For which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Listen to this. Here's the good news. Verse 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us. Works for us. A far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. Verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things that are, which we are, are not seen, they are eternal. How many know that the angels of the Lord are with us? How many know that? Have you read, have you not read in the Bible? The angel of the Lord is encamped around about them that fear him and love him. Have you not known that surely goodness and mercy follow us all the days of our life? Yeah, I think there's a couple of angels named goodness and mercy. Do you not know that though one third of heaven was cast out, there's still two thirds that were there? For every demon, there's two angels of God. Oh, blessed be, but more important than that is Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is. Give the Lord a praise. <laughs> God is our shield. God is our shield. Genesis 15 and 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Psalm 33, verse 20 and 20 through 22. The psalmist says, Oh, our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help. He is our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in Him. Because we have trusted in His holy name. We have trusted in His holy name. Verse 22, let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in thee. How many are hoping in the Lord today? I want you to know that hope is not in vain. He's going to see us through. He's going to see us through. And what I heard yesterday of those prayers, and if you've not seen those, if you've not seen that uh, service, the return, you can go back. It's in the bulletin. Be sure to get you a bulletin. You can go back this week and follow it. It is powerful. But when God's people repent, humble themselves and pray and seek His face, we're going to hear from heaven. God will forgive sin and heal the land. Amen? Amen. God is our shield. David said in Psalm 35, 1 and 2, Plead my cause, O Lord. With them that strive with me, fight against them that fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for mine help. You know the Lord will do that. In the Psalm 
to the sons of Korah in Psalms 84 and 9. Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed. He is Israel's shield. Psalms 115 verse 9. O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Not only is he Israel's shield, but watch what he says next in verse 10. O house of Aaron. Trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. And guess what? There's another verse. Verse 11. For all of us, ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. How many fear and respect God? I fear Him. I respect Him. He's a holy God. He's a just God. And thank God, He's the shield for every believer. And you know, Paul coupled the shield of faith with the sword of the Spirit, didn't he? Because he said, above all, take the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit and pray. Those three things. God's holy word is our shield. God's holy word is our shield. Psalm 119, 114. Thou art my hiding place and my shield, I hope. In thy word. I hope in thy word. If you're not in the habit of reading your Bible and, and reading scripture with your family, start now. One of my hopes was in the beginning of this pandemic when we shut down that I shared with many of you that watched online. This is a good time. If you're not in the habit of family devotions, now that you're having to stay home, start now. Turn off the TV and get into the Word and read the Word with your, your spouse, your children, your family, and pray together, pray together. There's so many homes that that's missing from. So many homes. And, and now that things have opened up, we shouldn't, we shouldn't let up on reading the Bible in prayer. Hello? We need to keep up with it, how the devil's going to try to fight you. But when you make up your mind, you're going to spend time with the shield of faith. You're taking it up. You're taking it up when you have devotions and when you get alone with Jesus and when you gather your family together and pray together. Darlene and I pray every morning and pray every night. And at nighttime, we call up my mom, my 92-year-old mom, and before we finish our conversation, we pray with my mom over the phone every night, every night. I don't want to dare ever walk out the door without spending time with my shield of faith and I take him with me wherever I go. Amen. Amen. Say, a, say amen real good and loud. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I want to close. Jeannie, come on back up here and let's prepare for prayer. In a moment, we're going to pray a prayer together. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And I want it to be from our hearts today, not just words. But God is calling His church to take up, above all, take up the shield of faith, the sword of the Spirit, and take up prayer. A prayerless church is a powerless church. Now, if I were to tell you today individually, Bernard Ridge Church of God is known as a praying church, what would your answer be? It is, isn't it? I'm grateful for that. You know, a lot of churches are not praying churches. But we don't need to let up. We don't need to give up. We need to pour on the prayer, push down, put the pedal to the metal in prayer. Don't let up. Ephesians 6, 16, again, the heart of our text, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Bible in basic English puts it this way, and most of all, using faith as a cover to keep off all the flaming arrows of the evil one. You may have already been through a fiery trial 
and you're coming out on the other side victorious. Some of you may in your family or maybe a member of your family is in the heat of a trial right now. And as I was preaching a while ago and the unction of the Holy Ghost flowed through me and you saw it manifested in my physical movements of my body, there may be someone or a family getting ready to face the trial of your life then this message is for all of us today. Above all, take up that shield of faith. Now, how many will do that today? Would you stand with me and prepare your hearts to repeat this prayer? Let it be from your heart, please. Please let it be from your heart. Ready? In fact, would you just lift your hands to heaven if you can? Heavenly Father, Help me to take up the shield of faith. We live in a broken world where the devil will fling his arrows of discord, arrows of doubt, and arrows of deceit. Every chance he can get. Heavenly Father, Arm me with the shield of faith today that I may be able to extinguish the devil's arrows and spread your gospel to those who need to hear it. Lord, help me when I doubt to remember your goodness, your graciousness, and your love, and to remember who you are. In the name of the one who is my shield and my champion, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now put your hands together. Believe God. Believe God. Hallelujah. Before we leave this room today, and my phone is not hooked up for the live stream, I don't know if there may be a prayer need or prayer request to come over it, but if there's someone here today that needs an extra brother or sister to come alongside with their shield to join with yours, and pray with you right now. I want you to step out. We're ready. There's a greater army here than the Roman army. It's the army of God. Oh, here they come. Here they come. The army of God. The army of God. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. Maybe you've gotten weak. We all get weak. I've gotten weak. There's times when I've gotten weak. And oh, I thank God for those times when my brothers and sisters and my family my precious wife that is so strong in the faith have come alongside to put their shield with mine and to pray together. Victory, 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 victory. Someone else. Someone else. I want all of our ministers to come up and minister spouses to come. And, and I want us all to gather around if you can or, or reach your hand this way if you can't. And we're going to pray right now. We're going to take up our shields of faith. We're going to put them together in the name of Jesus and believe God right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord for all of you. For you. Praying with me right now, would you just stretch your hand? This is for Riley and Clay. They have needs of healing. We're going to put our shield of faith together. Amen.